Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alexander Scott. I am your host and the outreach coordinator here at Latin American Perspectives. For this episode, I will be talking with LAP Associate Managing Editor, Dr. Steve Elner, about his edited book titled Latin America's Pink Tide, Breakthroughs and Shortcomings that was published in 2019 as part of the Latin American Perspectives in the Classroom series with Roman and Littlefield. We will also be discussing recent events in progressive politics in Latin America and the current state of the pink tide. Steve Elner is a historian and taught economic history and political science at the Universidad de Oriente in Venezuela from 1977 to 2003. Among his many books are Venezuela's Movimiento al Socialismo, From Guerrilla Defeat to Electoral Politics, Organized Labor in Venezuela, 1958 through 1991, Behavior and Concerns in a Democratic Setting, Rethinking Venezuelan Politics, Class Polarization and the Chavez Phenomenon, and Latin American Extractivism. He has published on the op-ed page of the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, and is a regular contributor to NACLA, Report on the Americas and In These Times. If you enjoy listening to my conversation with Steve, and you want to learn more about any of the topics we discuss, I encourage you to pick up a copy of his book from Roman and Littlefield at roman.com, or check out one of our many issues on Latin America's Pink Tide at latinamericanperspectives.com. Now, let's get to the show. Hey, Steve. How are you doing, Alex? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm uh, really excited to have this conversation with you about this really important topic. So the first question I have is, can you provide some background information on the book, specifically how the book came about, and what were the theoretical or political interventions you were trying to make with the text? Yeah, well, Alex, first, I, I want to thank you for the invitation to do this podcast on a topic that is so dynamic and is in the process of, of change as a result of uh, recent developments. Uh, after many predicted that the days of the pink tide were over, the pink tide has scored some impressive victories in, in Mexico with the election of Andres Manuel López Obrador in 2018, then Argentina with the election of the the two Fernandeses, <laughs> um, the vice president being Cristina Fernandez, who had been the Pink Tide pre president previously, and the election of Mas's Luis Arce, Mas being the party of Evo Morales. And now in the first round of the election in Ecuador, which brought uh, Andres Arauz, was, was in first place in spite of the persecution of his party, which is the party of Rafael Correa. So the, the background with regard to the, the, the book, the project was launched at a particular juncture, quite different from the more favorable situation now. It was 2018 to be exact. And at that point, progressive pink tide governments were in retreat. Previously, you know, at the beginning, the pink tide had generated such hope and such hope over a relatively extended period of time. You know, you compare the pink tide with the hope and expectations generated by Allende uh, when he was elected president in 1970. His presidency, his government lasted only three years. The pink tide dates back to Chavez's election in 1998, so that by 2018, at the time of the launching of this book project, the pink, pink tide phenomenon had encompassed two decades. So the idea of the book was to evaluate the pink tide experience and attempt to determine where things stood. Some were beginning to say in 2018 that the string of defeats that I, that I had mentioned, the defeat of the Pink Tide government in Argentina and then the, the impeachment of uh, Rousseff, Dilma Rousseff in, in Brazil, that the, the string of defeats that were underway was evidence that the Pink Tide had been a failure. And others like Jorge Castaneda, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, who's a political analyst and an academic, argued that the cycle of leftist governments was over. And in fact, the, uh, the mainstream media gloated over the, 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 this very claim that the pink tide was, that their days were, were numbered. And the, the basic argument was the pendulum argument, 
that politics in Latin America has always gone, you know, left to right, right to left. And that in that process, nothing really changes. Nothing really positive comes of it all. Politics is basically static in Latin America. And the Pink Tide experience was no exception. So you had the defeat of the Kirchner candidate in Argentina with the election of Mauricio Macri in late 2015, followed by Venezuela, the, the elections for the National Assembly. The opposition was victorious. It was a, a major victory for the opposition, although the media exaggerated uh, because the opposition received uh, 66, 67 percent, about two thirds of the number of diputados, deputies in the National Assembly. But their popular vote was 56, 57 percent. So the media uh, exaggerated, but still the Chavistas were defeated in those elections. And then came the Bolivia referendum shortly after that, in which um, Evo Morales was defeated. The possibility of his running for re-election was defeated by a very slight margin. But that was another defeat. And then came what's known as the lawfare against the left. In the case of Bolivia, and excuse me, in the case of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff on flimsy charges of corruption. And then the jailing of Lula, which paved the way for Bolsonaro's uh, election. And that same lawfare tactic uh, was used against Morales in, in Bolivia. He was prevented from returning to Bolivia for, from running for office because of charges against him. And the case of Ecuador, with the election of Lenin Moreno. Moreno was the candidate of uh, Correa. He had been his vice president previously. And Correa's vice president at that particular moment, who was Jorge Glass, was Moreno's uh, vice president. He was elected, and he was elected on the basis of continuing the policies of Rafael Correa. As soon as he, as he was elected, he did a complete turnabout. He jailed Jorge Glass on charges of corruption involving the Brazilian company Odebrecht. He was accused of, of taking bribes from that company. And Correa was also accused of knowing about those bribes. And so he was pre prevented from running for, for president and even vice president. So that you had a string of defeats at the time of the launching of the book. That was the situation for the, for the Pink Tide. And we were interested in analyzing those defeats to determine where things stood for the Pink Tide. Now, with all of that in mind, I'm curious, what was your argument in the book regarding the thesis that the pink tide had failed? We, we argued that the pink tide had really not failed, that the days of the pink tide were not over, regardless of the electoral outcomes. The fact of the matter is that you have to compare the pink tide and that experience with other waves uh, of democratic and progressive government, some replacing military regimes, some manifesting a degree of nationalism, if not anti-imperialism, as in the case of Allende. With analysis and a comparative analysis, uh, you reach the conclusion that the pink tide was a much more significant development than previous waves for, for several reasons. Firstly, the duration of these pink tide governments was without precedent. Now that the Pink Tide has scored a number of recent victories, it could be said that from 1998 to 2021, where things stand now, I mean, 20, 22 years, 22, 23 years have passed by. Compare that with the post-World War II democratic wave uh, in Venezuela with the so-called triennial government of Romulo Betancourt and Romulo Gallegos. That was a triennial, three years Peru also with Jose Luis Bustamante, three years. Uh, Peron, the nationalistic government of Peron and Vargas in Brazil, Peron lasted nine years from 1946 to 1955. So these, this wave, uh, nationalistic and democratic wave after World War II, lasted a shorter period of time. It took in less countries, 
Because in the case of the Pink Tide, we're talking about most of South America. We're talking about Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. So it takes in a much greater number of countries uh, and, and, and a larger duration. But that's really those two factors. But another factor, which explains the importance of the Pink Tide and the reason why we argue in the book that the Pink Tide was not a failure, is the sense of solidarity that existed among these Pink Tide governments. The fact that there's a term, the Pink Tide, in the first place, just the use of the term, uh, indicates that there's a sense of unity among these countries. Uh, there's a sense of solidarity with the creation of UNASUR, Petro Caribe, which, which was really an important development. Petro Caribe, which takes in the countries of uh, the Caribbean countries and the Central American countries, is a result of Venezuelan oil diplomacy, which really has much to do with the, the sense of solidarity. Uh, ALBA, which are the more radical pink tide governments, which took in Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, and, and of course, Cuba and Venezuela, which were the, the, the founders of ALBA. But in the case of CELAC, when once UNASUR was launched, Central American countries indicated that they felt that they should be included in the Caribbean countries as well. So CELAC takes in all of Latin America. And this is a reaction, or this is rather a result of a position that Chavez took at the Summit of the Americas in Quebec City in, in early, two, I think it was April 2001, in which the United States proposed, this was the beginning of the Bush administration, they proposed the launching of the free trade area of the Americas. And Chavez was the only heads of state at that meeting who argued that this uh, was not the time and place for that because any kind of free area of the Americas that took in the United States and Canada, Latin America would be in a position of disadvantage, a disadvantageous position because of its weaker economies. And so, although he didn't discard the idea of a free trade union of the Americas at a future date, he said that Latin America had to catch up so that Latin America would negotiate as equals. And so CELAC and UNASUR had a lot to do with that proposal. So the, the first argument that the pink tide was not a defeat is based on the idea that the pink tide was a much more solid phenomenon, was much more solid development than the waves of you know, democratic governments and progressive governments of the past. Our second argument against this idea of the pendulum or the argument of Castaneda, uh, uh, among others, that the pink tide is over and has amounted to very little, was that regardless of the outcome of future elections, even if the pink tide was defeated in other countries as well, don't forget that Morales was still in power in Bolivia, Correa was still in power in Ecuador in 2018, but we basically argue that regardless of these future electoral developments, that the pink tide had framed issues and had framed narratives that were to have a long lasting impact on politics. For instance, the issue of inequality that neoliberalism never even mentions because neoliberals adhere to the trickle down theory, the win-win concept that uh, regardless of inequality that everybody gains by neoliberal reforms. And so it doesn't matter if some people are richer and some people are getting even richer in comparison to others, uh, everybody is winning out. Um, so that the pink tide uh, 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 addressed itself to the issue of inequality. And just to add parenthetically, that um, Taylor Pickoff, who some of you might have heard of, he was a communist guerrilla in the 1960s, and then he founded the Mas Party of Venezuela, not to be confused with the Mas Party of Bolivia, uh, and then became conservative, and he was an anti-Chavista, very much uh, involved in the anti-Chavista, uh, the opposition to Chavez, but he recognized that you have to give Chavez credit. This is what he said. 
because Chavez placed the issue of poverty on the table. That up until then, it wasn't an issue raised by establishment politicians. So that this is, you know, an issue that the Pink Tide addressed and was unlikely to go away because poverty was unlikely to go away. Another issue that the Pink Tide placed on the table was the issue of incorporation. You know, the previous wave of incorporation that political scientists have analyzed in depth uh, occurred in the first half of the, the 20th century, um, especially under populist governments such as the government of Peron in Argentina and Vargas in, in Brazil. But the incorporation, that incorporation involved the working class, the workers of the formal economy who developed unions, got the right to vote. That was the phenomenon of incorporation, uh, the first wave of incorporation. But the incorporation engineered by the Pink Tide was that of the workers of the informal economy. These are the people uh, who are completely on the margin, not just economically, but legally, culturally. Uh, they have no legislative protection since labor law, for the most part, doesn't apply to the workers of the informal economy. And when Chavez talked of 21st century socialism as a Latin American phenomenon, he implicitly was saying that the existence of such a large informal economy differentiates Venezuelan socialism, differentiates Latin American socialism from European socialist Marxist uh, traditions uh, based on the proletariat. So today, the issue is of great relevance, for develop even for developed nations, uh, due to the blurring of the distinction between workers of the formal and informal economy as a result of the, you know, the gig economy, the share economy, the large percentage of immigrant workers who might be working in the formal economy, but are really on the margin because they're, they're immigrants and in a lot of cases, undocumented immigrants, the precarity of work, all these phenomena, um, phenomena which um, are especially significant today means that the issues raised by the Pink Tide governments um, and the Pink Tide narrative um, is of great importance. And so the argument that the Pink Tide phenomenon is over and the issues that the Pink Tide raised are irrelevant and that the Pink Tide was a complete failure, we rejected that thesis in the book. Well, I think that was a pretty astute rejection of that thesis, which really comes off more like conservative propaganda than anything or neoliberal propaganda than anything. But as we'll talk later in the podcast about evaluating the current state of the pink tide, I'm pretty sure the argument you make in the book was proven valid, uh, but we'll get to that a little later. Now, before we move on, I think it's important that we provide our listeners with a little more background information on the pink tide. I'm assuming many folks are aware of the pink tide and what it is, but some folks might not be. So can we discuss like what was the political economic context in which the pink tide emerged um, and what were the specific political programs or projects that were pursued by the pink tide governments and maybe what were some of their achievements as well? Sure, Alex. Uh, you know, the pink tide, uh, emerged as a reaction to the neoliberalism whose heyday was in the 1990s. At the, at the time, uh, many, many observers, I'd say most observers, uh, overestimated the solidity of the neoliberal phenomenon. You know, this was a period, the 1990s was a period of, um, you know, neoliberalism uh, throughout Latin America. You didn't, you didn't have any government uh, outside of Cuba, of course, uh, that called itself anti-neoliberal. Uh, the closest to that was Caldera in, Rafael Caldera was elected president in, in Venezuela as an anti-neoliberal in 1993, but then he embraced neoliberalism shortly after that. So that this idea that there is no alternative to neoliberal capitalism, TINA, there is no alternative. That's what TINA stands for. And that was promoted by Margaret Thatcher in Great Britain, Francis Fukuyama's The End of History. I was going to mention that, The End of History. The End of History, which indicates that not, not only is capitalism the only uh, uh, game in town and is here to stay, but in the case of Fukuyama, in the case of Thatcher, uh, 
they were just they weren't talking about capitalism per se. They were talking about neoliberal style capitalism. And in the case of the British Marxist Perry Anderson, referring specifically to Latin America, he said that neoliberalism was the most hegemonic system in history. But you know, hege- hegemony implies consensus. And this was not the case in the 1990s. The, the situation in Latin America from which the pink tide emerged was a situation of uh, social instability, perhaps not political instability, but at first social instability. Firstly, because the neoliberals won elections in the 1990s, but they won elections through deceit. They they switch and bait tactic in which candidates run on an anti-neoliberal platform and then embrace neoliberals. As I mentioned before, in the case of Caldera, um, he was uh, he was supported by the Communist Party. He was supported by MAS, uh, the Petkoff's party, which was a socialist party. Uh, it's still around, but it's hardly socialist. But in 1993, uh, Caldera was somewhat of a leftist, but he embraced neoliberalism. The best example of that was Fujimori, who, who beat Vargas Llosa on the basis of an anti-neoliberal pr- platform in 1990. Uh, and then implemented a, a more radical form of neoliberalism than what Vargas Llosa advocated. And to a lesser extent, that happened in the case of Carlos Andres Perez in 1988, Menem in Argentina. I mean, they were identified with uh, traditions of state intervention in the economy. Uh, Acción Democrática stood for that originally. Uh, certainly the Peronistas, Menem was a Peronista there, uh, Peron's legacy was one of nationalism, economic nationalism, and state intervention in the economy. And so there was an element of, of deceit. And that led into a situation of discontent so that I would, I would question Anderson's use of the term hegemony to describe the neoliberal governments of the 1990s. The, the resistance to neoliberalism was felt throughout the decade. Uh, and, and this paved the way for the pink tide in, in, the, in the following decade. In Venezuela, for instance, the, the nationwide disturbances on the week of February 27th, 1989, initiated a wave of protests that led into Chavez's abortive coup on February 4th, 1992. And that, you know, incidentally took place just weeks, like two or three weeks after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that at the same time that the experts were announcing the death of socialism and and pointing to the Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe as evidence for the fact that socialism was now uh, a phenomenon of the past um, and and arguing for the permanent hegemony of capitalism, uh, as in the case of Thatcher and Fukuyama, um, there was resistance to neoliberal style uh, capitalism popular resistance that um, was spearheaded by social movements. Uh, In the case of Bolivia, for instance, the famous gas wars and the water war, um, this resistance paved the way for the triumph of Morales. Um, And the same thing happened. There were different scenarios, but basically the same pattern of protests, social movement, social movements getting organized, And this creating great expectations and a momentum that led into the pink tide electoral victories, beginning with Chavez in 1998. Thank you for that that context. I think that's really important. It will help our listeners understand the conversation going forward. Now, what were some of the specific political programs or or projects that were pursued by uh, the pink tide governments? And if you could identify any specific achievements. I think you mentioned some earlier, but uh, just briefly, I would love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Firstly, I I would point to the social programs. And this is somewhat of a consensus on that, that the the social programs of the pink tide governments were successful. And the statistics demonstrate that uh, poverty was reduced in, in all these pink tide countries. What the experts, which what many of the experts don't mention, is that these were not handouts. Of course, you always have an element. Social programs always contain an element of income distribution favoring the popular sectors. 
But in the case of the community councils, or in the case of Venezuela, the communal councils that were created, you had a, a popular participation. You had social programs that were paid to children going to school in poor areas where many uh, children don't go to school. So that there was a sense of participation, there was a sense of empowerment, uh, which is an important aspect of the social programs that Pink Tide governments promoted. But in addition to that, several of the Pink Tide governments began to expropriate, nationalize basic industries. And that's extremely important because that countered the massive privatization that took place in the, in the 1990s during the neoliberal period. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, you know, there was a near consensus in Venezuela for many years that basic industry should be controlled by the state. And this goes back to, you know, I mentioned Action, Action Democratica coming from a, a fairly leftist tradition in the 1940s. Action Democra Democratica and its precursor party, the PDN, uh, in the late 1930s, talked about, you know, nationalization of basic industries in Venezuela. And that was supported uh, in the 1960s, even by the conservative party, COPE, so that you had a near consensus in favor of the idea that uh, the government should control, the state should control the strategic sectors of the economy. And that, that concept was incorporated into the Constitution of 1961. So Chavez comes, comes along, and after 10 years of privatization of Venezuela, in which these strategic companies had been privatized. Uh, the oil industry was uh, virtually privatized in a program called the oil opening, the Apertura Petrolera. The telecommunications industry was privatized. In fact, it was taken over by a company that Verizon purchased. So Verizon owned the Venezuelan telephone company when Chavez nationalized that in, in, in 2007. The steel industry, which was a state run from the beginning, CIDOR, was privatized in 1997. So that the nationalization of strategic companies, I think, was another important step that was taken by pink tide countries. In Argentina, in the case of the oil industry, in the case of Bolivia with the gas uh, industry and other companies were, were expropriated by the Morales government, and these expropriations weren't always 100% expropriations, but it meant greater state control. In the case of Argentina, for instance, uh, the uh, Kirchner, Cristina Kirchner government, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, bought a majority share of the state or the, of, the, of the oil company, YPF. So that this was another important development. Um, you know, the commodity boom of the early 20th century provided uh, the resources for pink tide governments to finance these ambitious uh, social programs that I mentioned, and also to a certain degree, the takeover of strategic companies. Some of these takeovers were not uh, confiscations, and the governments had the resources to, to uh, compensate the, the former owners. Now, the uh, many uh, uh, commentators and many analysts attribute these developments to the commodity boom of this period. That is, the ba basic commodities that uh, Latin America exports. When they talk about the commodity boom, they're not talking about commodities in general. They're talking about natural resources, and they're talking about agricultural products that aren't processed in the country. These are called basic commodities. And the boom in the early uh, 20th century, partly as a result of the, the Chinese market opening up purchases by China, but also the prosperity in other countries as well. So that rather than analyze the situation in detail, a lot of analysts just say, well, you know, the price of these basic commodities increased. There was a boom in the, in the oil prices and the prices of other basic commodities. And as a result, these pink tide countries were able to implement these ambitious social programs. But the fact of the matter is that these pink tide governments implemented policies based on resource nationalism 
they improve the terms for host countries uh, so that the pink tide and the and not global capitalism deser- deserves credit for the increase in government revenue that finance the social programs. And here, and let, let me, uh, Alex, just make a plug for my, my most recent edited book, also Please, published yeah. by Ronan and Littlefield uh, with Latin American Perspectives as part of the Latin American Perspectives in the Classroom series. Uh, the title of that book is Latin American Extractivism, Dependency, Resource Nationalism, and Resistance in Broad Perspective. That book just came out, well, just a few months ago, early 2021. Um, and in the book, the we, we argue, the, the writers, myself included, uh, we, we focus on the neo-extractivism that has characterized uh, the pink tide in other Latin American countries in the 21st century. And we argue against the thesis that lumps the pink tide in the same category as conservative and even right-wing governments on the basis of the fact that all of them extolled the commodities consensus. That's a term that Maristela Svampa, who writes on, on the uh, neo-extractivism, a term that she uses in order to argue that, or state perhaps implicitly, that all the Latin American governments were doing the same thing. They were um, promoting the export of primary commodities and justifying that dependence on global capitalism uh, and those exports on the basis of the fact that the revenue was financing social programs. But those writers leave out of the picture the fact that the revenue derived from these exports varied according to the degree of economic nationalism. And that differentiated pink tide governments from non-leftist ones. The other point that needs to be made with regard to the revenue that financed these programs and the difficulties that pink tide governments faced uh, after the stock crash of 2008 is that there was a lessening of demand for commodities as a result of the stock crash of 2008 and the contraction to a degree uh, or the lessening of the expansion of the Chinese economy. So that very often uh, writers explain the pink tide phenomenon and the challenges that the pink tide faced after 2008 on the basis of China. China singled out uh, as explaining the expansion prior to 2008 and the contraction after 2008. That is, uh, that China imported the commodities. There was a great increase in Chinese imports of basic commodities. And then after 2008, uh, the situation changed with regard to China. But a broader analysis is in order. That is, that capitalism has always been characterized by expansion, crisis, and contraction. So it wasn't a question of just the Chinese economy. It was a question of the capitalist system. And in that sense, I think that the pink tide governments such as Venezuela, deserve a degree of criticism for not having anticipated that inevitable inevitable development. That is, it was inevitable that the expansion of the early years of the 20th century was going to come to an end and contraction was going to set in. I think that's a really important point that is not heard typically and commonly overlooked, I think, in like mainstream analysis, even mainstream left analysis. Of course, we want to support the pink tide governments, progressive governments, but it's important to identify points where they they weren't planning ahead. They overlooked, like you were saying, this inevitable contraction in the global capitalist economy. I think that's a a really important point. And in regards to your your new book, I'm working on getting a, a copy right now from your publisher so we can do another podcast on that book. Now, I, I, I could have sent you a PDF version. Okay, cool. Maybe we can talk about that. Absolutely. Certainly, no problem. Now, you already started to touch on the macro political economic factors that may have influenced this ebbing of the pink tide. Um, but I, I'd be curious to talk about that more. Like, what were some of economic and social factors that influenced this ebbing, both macro and maybe national like political movements or right wing opposition? What what influence those had on this ebbing of the pink tide? Yeah, I, I'm glad, Alex, that you asked that question uh, because it's qu- it's quite relevant to the difficulties faced by the pink tide governments and the string of defeats 
beginning with the elections in Argentina, as I mentioned before. And I think the, the, the best example uh, with regard to the economic difficulties that uh, the pink tide faced uh, is the case of Venezuela, because the, um, the, the economic crisis in Venezuela is, is, is greater than that of other countries. And this, this question is, is relevant because the Venezuelan government, I'm sorry, the Venezuelan opposition and many analysts, including scholars, claim that Venezuela's economic problems cannot be contributed to the sanctions imposed by the Trump administration um, because Venezuela's economic difficulties preceded Trump's election in 2016. Uh, and there, there is an element of truth in that uh, because the economic difficulties and specifically the inflation that was set off as a result of the, the exchange control system, the deterioration of the local currency goes back to before 2016. In fact, it began in late 2012 when Chavez went off to Cuba for the, for the last time for treatment of his cancerous tumor. Uh, and it was sort of a power vacuum in Venezuela. Um, this is between you know, late 2012 and then Chavez's death in March of 2013 and Maduro was elected president uh, in April of 2013. So that during those four or five, three or four months, you had a somewhat of a power vacuum and the exchange rent rate went amok. The, the dollar skyrocketed. Some commentators, some analysts like the Venezuelan economist and prestigious university professor Pascalina Curcio, she teaches at the prestigious Simon Bolivar University. She argues on the basis of uh, considerable empirical evidence that she, provide, that she always provides, that that situation of the exchange control uh, and inflation was uh, not un unintentional. It was a form of economic sab sabotage. But regardless of, the, of this dis of the discussion about uh, the exchange control system in Venezuela, which is quite complicated, so I won't get into that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, okay, there were economic difficulties by 2016 when Trump was elected president, but those difficulties were nothing in comparison to the situation today. If you compare Trump's first months in office in August of 2017, when he implemented the first sanctions against Venezuela. In the situation today, there is no comparison whatsoever. Venezuelans are currently living in a, a, a desperate situation. There's no question about it. That was not the situation in 2016. And that situation is due to the sanctions more than anything else. Sure, there are other factors. The errors committed by the government uh, of Maduro and, and Chavez, which, you know, different people have different uh, explanations. I have, you know, my theories and others have other theories, but there's no question. I think the, the Chavistas themselves recognize errors that were, were made. The exchange control system that I just mentioned, which I'm not going to get into, and I don't think it was a mistake per se. I'm not opposed to exchange controls, but they did get out of, get out of hand and the government should have taken bold measures in order to rationalize that system, not necessarily discard it, but rationalize it. So that's an error. And the price of oil is another factor that explains the desperate economic situation that Venezuela finds itself in today. But the sanctions are mostly responsible. You know, Alex, you know, back around 2016, when I, when I talked about uh, this issue of, you know, the economic difficulties, when I wrote about it and talked about it, I would say there are three different factors. Uh, the mistakes, the price of oil that nosedived uh, in 2015, and the war on Venezuela, these, the measures taken by the US government beginning with, with Bush. Uh, those are three factors. And I'd say that you really can't quantify, uh, you really can't determine the weight of each one of those factors. I said that in 2016. Today, there is no question that the sanctions against Venezuela are largely responsible, that the, that the weight assigned to each one of these three factors, the sanctions in the war in Venezuela 
is by far the most important factor. And the other point I want to make here is that it's not just the sanctions that Trump implemented. Uh, Obama imposed sanctions on, on, on Venezuela uh, at the time that he declared Venezuela a threat to U.S. national security, an executive order that was issued in early 2015. And shortly after that, the president of the United States declares Venezuela a threat to national security. Naturally, U.S. companies are going to react to that. Um, and shortly after that, you know, one company after another pulled out of Venezuela, beginning with Kimberly Clark, Ford, and then uh, after that, General Motors, Kellogg, a whole string of U.S. companies pulled out of Venezuela. So it wasn't just Trump's sanctions on the Venezuelan oil industry, on Venezuelan gold, which, you know, b because the oil industry was sabotaged <clears throat> by these measures, by the Trump administration, Venezuela started, the Maduro government started exporting gold and looking to that sector as a source of revenue. And so the Trump administration uh, sanctioned Venezuelan gold as well. So that it wasn't only the sanctions uh, on the part of the Trump administration. What I call the war on Venezuela, which goes beyond economic measures, uh, takes in, you know, the military threat, the threat of military intervention, military intervention uh, in the form of the incursion from Colombia, the drone attack that almost killed Maduro, his wife, and the high command of the armed forces. All of these developments affected the Venezuelan economy. The WikiLeaks documents, known as Cablegate, demonstrate that U.S. diplomatic officials uh, implemented a host of programs uh, sponsored by the National Endowment for Democracy, USAID, the affiliates of the National Endowment for Democracy, including the uh, Institutes of the Democratic and Republican Parties, the Solidarity Center of the AFL-CIO. These cables indicated that U.S. officials considered Venezuela a highly toxic country and that regime change was necessary. And they promoted programs that were designed not necessarily to bring about regime change in the short term, uh, but were certainly designed to undermine the authority of the Venezuelan government uh, and support the opposition, which was favoring regime change in Venezuela from the, practically from the beginning, or at least uh, at the time of the, the coup in 2002, they were not recognizing the legitimacy of the Venezuelan government. And these programs, uh, sponsored by the NED and sponsored by USAID, were supporting the opposition, that very opposition. And these programs took in a, a wide area of democratic democracy promotion, the communications media, law enforcement, civilian military relations, to name just a few. And these programs were designed to undermine the authority of the Chavista government. The follow-up of the elections of 2006, which Chavez won with 63% of the vote, these programs, USAID and NED, targeted young people, the youth. And in two, this was known as the generation of 2007. And out of that, uh, a number of leaders today emerged, including Juan Guaido and Miguel Pizarro and a number of uh, important opposition leaders. So that, you know, I, I kind of got off on a tangent, Alex, talking about Venezuela, which of course is my country of, of passion and, and knowledge. Um, but really the point that I'm trying to make is that the aggressiveness of the right wing opposition to the pink tide had a lot to do with the economic problems that those countries faced and that the U.S. government had a lot to do with those oppositions. Uh, the U.S. government through these different programs supported the oppositions that didn't recognize the legitimacy of those governments. You know, uh, the term disloyal opposition is used. It's a term used by political scientists in the United States. There might, it might be a, a relative uh, degree of disloyalty. Some oppositions are more disloyal than others. But basically, disloyal opposition means non-recognition of the legitimacy of the government. And this was the case to a greater or lesser extent with the opposition in many of these pink-tied countries.
there are so many really important points that you just brought up that if we had more time, I would love to get to get into. Um, but in particular, I, I love how you describe it as the war on Venezuela, because that's really what it is. Essentially, U.S. foreign policy is to create a economic and social situation in the country where people are experiencing so much hardship and uh, so many inequities and, and issues that it pushes them towards the opposition. In addition to that, the U.S. is obviously funded via Colombia, counterinsurgents and drone attacks and things like that. And these are issues that are just never talked about in mainstream media here in the United States. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Another thing you brought up is how this opposition comes out of a context where the United States is directly funneling funds and literature and knowledge and training to uh, create a stronger opposition, you said around like 2006, 2007 uh, in Venezuela, but I know this is the case in other countries as well. Now, in the introduction of the book, you highlight that it's important to discuss the degree of aggression, uh, aggressiveness from this right-wing opposition. And, you know, in the United States, when we see portrayals of the opposition in countries like Venezuela or even Bolivia, they're framed as these like freedom fighters, these people who just want democracy, um, students, young people. And of course, many of these people certainly are. But I think that overlooks this history you're talking about of how the, the opposition emerged against the pink tide and who the central actors in this opposition are. So I'd just be curious to hear more of your thoughts on in the role of the opposition in undermining the democratic uh, efforts of the pink tide governments and their egalitarian projects. Sure, the opposition, as I mentioned before, did not recognize the legitimacy of these pink tide governments. Perhaps at first they did, but in country after country, you know, the scenario varied, but there was the use of force to bring about regime change. For instance, in the case of Bolivia, there were disturbances, violent disturbances, attacks on government buildings, attacks on the followers of Evo Morales. In the eastern part of Bolivia, and specifically in the province or the department of Santa Cruz, which is the breadbasket of the Bolivian economy, uh, which has taken on a, a, a greater economic importance than was the case, you know, 30, 40 years ago uh, because of the gas and other natural resources. And, you know, I think the important thing to point out here, Alex, is the, these attempts at regime change uh, at first failed in the case of Bolivia, in the case of Venezuela with the coup attempt right. on April 11th, uh, 2002, in the case of Ecuador, with the, with the police rebellion, which was also designed to overthrow uh, the government because it, it, it had support in the military uh, against Correa. But I think the important thing to, to keep in mind is that the damage, the importance of these violent acts of opposition is that it forced the government into changing gear. And in a lot of cases, negotiating with the opposition. For instance, in the case of Bolivia, uh, Morales, uh, after the passage of the constitution and his reelection with 64% of the vote, he attempted to bring about economic stability and social and political stability in Santa Cruz. That, that was very important for him, even though he had won the elections with 64% of the vote, without Santa Cruz, uh, Bolivia was going to have a difficult time, economically speaking. And so he reached agreements with the business elite of Santa Cruz, and there were concessions with regard to agrarian reform and, and other policies that lessened the support that he had from the social movements. So there was a trade-off here. He gained uh, economic stability and even political support in Santa Cruz, in which some of his candidates or some of the candidates that he supported or he endorsed uh, won elections in Santa Cruz, which was really the um, strong centers of the opposition. So he gained out politically in Santa Cruz, but he lost out politically uh, in other areas, and it really affected his agenda for change. In the case of Venezuela, something similar happened in the sense that uh, 
as a result of the attempted coup against Chavez. And seven or eight months later, the general strike, which was spearheaded by the business uh, organization Fede Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce of Venezuela, uh, in which Chavez was overthrown and the new president of Venezuela for all of 48 hours was the president of Fede Commerce, Pedro Carmona. And as a result of those uh, episodes, Chavez decided that political loyalty had to be prioritized. And so in the case of the oil industry, you know, the general strike that took place in late 2002 was basically, it's called the Paro Petrolero, the, a, a, a war oil shutdown, uh, because it was largely centered in the oil industry. And the oil executives and a lot of the white collar workers, the professional and technical workers, they supported the strike. The, the workers didn't. The blue collar workers didn't to a large degree, but the professionals did. And so Chavez's lesson, I mean, this might have been overlearning, what political scientists call overlearning, a term that Jennifer McCoy uses in one of her books. Chavez emphasized the importance of loyalty and unity. He coined the term unity, unity, and more unity. And so that took preference or precedence over perhaps professional competence. And this might have hurt the Chavistas, it might have hurt the government, might have hurt the economy as a result. So that this violent opposition to the Pink government, spearheaded by the opposition, forced the government into re-examining their, their strategy for change. And in a lot of cases, it slowed down the process. In a lot of cases, it meant that different objectives were sacrificed because the political objective of maintaining stability uh, and defeating the opposition took precedence. So my next question then is regarding your book and something you've already started to touch upon. Can you highlight some of the major lessons we can learn from the pink tide regarding these political strategies and their response to the opposition in, in, the, con in the case that you were just mentioning? I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I would say that the major lesson, and one that is emphasized in the book, uh, I discuss it in my introductory chapter, my chapter in Venezuela, and is discussed in other chapters as well, is the importance of timing. At specific moments, the pink tide governments had the upper hand vis-a-vis -vis the opposition. They had a great amount of prestige. There was a degree of stability in the country. And at moments like that, it's necessary to take full advantage by making strides towards achieving specific objectives. These objectives include deepening the process of change, combating corruption and bureaucratic lethargy, striking out at other sectors of the opposition that were engaged in illegal activity, taking unpopular but necessary measures. I mentioned before the exchange control system, which any measure to get that system under control, any government, be it leftist, rightist, or centrist, would pay a political price uh, so it's at moments in which the progressive government has the upper hand that the government could carry out these measures. Uh, these measures were, were politically feasible. And Chavez, for instance, did this in 2007 to a great extent. He was elected president, re-elected president in 2006 with 63% of the vote. And so he took advantage of that upper hand. The opposition was defeated. It was demoralized. Uh, that's when he nationalized strategic sectors of the economy. I mentioned before the steel industry, telecommunications, the oil industry. Chavez said that he nationalized it. I, I would say that's overly dramatic, but he did gain greater state control of the, of the oil industry and the cement industry. And the, the oldest bank in Venezuela, the Banco de Venezuela, was taken over. So he took advantage of that. He launched the, the party, the mass-based party, the PSUV, in early 2007, so that he took advantage of that upper hand. And he also struck out at the opposition, the disloyal opposition. He did not renew the concession of Radio Caracas, which, is an, which was an important TV channel. Uh, he was you know, accused of undemocratic behavior, of violation of the uh, press freedom, 
But the fact of the matter is that that channel, you know, openly supported the coup against Chavez, and it interviewed coup leaders after the coup was defeated. One of the generals, the president, the head of Radio Caracas, Marcel Granier, interviewed this guy and basically he stated, well, we have to attempt another coup. That was justified by the government on the basis of the fact that Radio Caracas was engaged in illegal activity. That was a justification for that measure. So Chavez did a lot. He took advantage of that situation. But I believe that Chavez and Maduro could have done more. Chavez emphasized the electoral goals of winning elections. The 2006 election, he wanted to win by 10 million votes. That was an exaggeration. That was unnecessary. Uh, he could have won by less than 67%, or sorry, I'm sorry, 63%, or he could have won by less than 10 million votes. That would not have made such a difference. I believe that he could have done more, especially in the area of combating corruption. And the same thing with Maduro. In 2013, the Chavistas won the municipal elections with an 11.5% margin. And shortly after that, defeated the the violent protests that that lasted four months, uh, known as the Guarimba. So that at that point, Maduro definitely had the upper hand. The opposition was definitely demoralized. And yet he didn't act. He didn't really do anything. He said that he was going to bring about a uh, shakeup of the cabinet, El Sacadón de la Gabinete. He announced a change in the cabinet. Then he put off that announcement. And when he finally made the change in the cabinet, it was really basically musical chairs in which some ministers uh, went from one ministry to another. So that he could have done more, especially in the area of combating corruption, which by then was a big issue in Venezuela. So that I think the lesson, the most important lesson in my mind, is that when Pintai governments, when progressive governments have the upper hand after a, a, a victory, the government has to act immediately because otherwise there will be a, a missed opportunity. And at a future date, when the situation changes, the government will not be in a position to be able to bring about important changes. And that's the situation today with with Venezuela. I mean, at this particular moment, there's very little that Maduro can do in terms of, you know, economic programs, social programs. The situation doesn't allow for that. I'm not saying that there's nothing for him to do. There certainly is. But the opportunities are much more limited than they were back in 2013, 2014, when the Chavistas had the upper hand. You know, another example of that is the case of Bolivia, which uh, Linda Farthing uh, analyzes in her chapter on Bolivia for the book, that, as I mentioned before, Morales won the elections after the ratification of the Constitution with 64% of the vote and had the majority in both houses of Congress. And as I mentioned before, Morales negotiated with the business elite of Santa Cruz, even though he had established stability and had won those elections with an overwhelming majority of the vote. I think that those negotiations with the elite of Santa Cruz could have been redimensioned. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have negotiated and perhaps made concessions, but uh, he might have gone overboard in that sense because of the the situation, because of that particular juncture in which his party, Mas, had a majority in Congress and the opposition was so demoralized, uh, it seems to me that those concessions, to a certain degree, were unnecessary. Right. Like you said, you're not saying that he shouldn't have made any sort of concessions or or any effort to work with the opposition of Santa Cruz. But you look at how far at where that eventually ended up with the coup in 2019. It was largely led by all the op- and, and elites from Santa Cruz. And I'm not saying that it's because he collaborated with them or made concessions with them. But I, th- I think there is a lesson there when you you have made a significant victory against the opposition that you act on that, right? So, so it's only, and you know, you mentioned the coup against Morales, which was a coup, there's no question about that, yeah. in 2019. And the fact that, the matter is that that organization, the, business, the main business organization in Santa Cruz, uh, 
called on Morales to resign. He, he's, they, they supported the effort to oust Morales. So that attempting to buy or making concessions in order to neutralize the elites uh, only goes so far. No, absolutely. I think there's a serious lesson in that. We can't fall victim to the, uh, the neoliberal trap of collaborating with elites or collaborating with capital. Now, with all of that being said, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts or your take on the current state of the pink tide and progressive politics in Latin America. So we're kind of returning now back to what we we're talking about in the beginning of the podcast, how the book was supposed to be a refutation of this thesis that the pink tide was over, it was inevitable, and we've seen resurgence in the past couple of years. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think that these recent inroads, as I mentioned before, first in, in Mexico with the election of Lopez Obrador, and then Argentina, Bolivia, now Ecuador, and also the fact that Maduro has survived politically in spite of the dire economic situation that exists in that country, right. uh, as well as the political hostility, aggressiveness uh, on the part of Washington that doesn't seem to be uh, diminishing uh, under the Biden administration. No, not at all. That uh, th this, this really can be explained by, by, by two factors. One is that it shows that these pink tide governments uh, were not discredited to the extent that some analysts claim. You read some of these works by scholars and, and non-scholars on extractivism, for instance, in Latin America, and you kind of get the impression that these pink tide governments completely sold out. They established close ties to international capitalism, global capitalism, and they clashed with social movements that, according to these analysts, were uniformly in opposition to the developmental pro projects, the mega projects sponsored by these governments. And I'm not saying that there's not an element of truth. In fact, the, the book on extractivism points that out, that the, the extractivist projects of pink tide governments uh, ha have to be examined and, and they have their pros and cons. But the demonization of pink tide governments, I think, is debunked by these recent developments because the pink tide would not have returned to power, for instance, in the case of Argentina with, with Kirchner. Had that been the case, the MAS party, the candidate of Evo Morales, would not have won by a surprising margin. I mean, it was predictable that the MAS party was going to win the elections in Bolivia a few months ago, but the victory was much greater than what was anticipated. So that the only way to explain the situation uh, is to recognize that these political leaders and parties are popular. And the second explanation is that the conservative movements, the movements that were so closely identified with neoliberalism, the same parties that were in power in the 1990s that implemented the neoliberal policies that were so discredited, they were so discredited that in some cases, it, what, it was not the centrists that won those elections, but the right. Let's make a distinction between the center and the right. And in the case of Colombia, uh, certainly Ivan Duque and uh, his party is a rightist party. Uribe is the, the strong man behind that government. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, it wasn't the party of Temir that was elected. It wasn't the, the centrists that were, were elected in Brazil. In fact, in the second round of the elections, it was Lula's party that went to the second round. But Bolsonaro, who represents the right, the far right in, in Brazil, in the case of Chile, Piñera, in the case of Ecuador, uh, Moreno has turned out to be uh, a rightist, not a centrist. So that it really, there's a polarization in which you have the pink tide squared off against the right, not the center, but the right. And I think that explains also the reason why the pink tide has scored these successes over the recent past. And another factor to bring in is that even though as part of this demonization of the pink tide, those governments were accused of 
uh, violation of democratic norms. And that's you know an issue that I won't get into, Alex, unless you want to go on for another hour. <laughs> but um, I mean, I'd like to, but I don't know if we have the time. Certainly, but what, what I will say is that there's no question of the fact that regardless of that discussion, regardless of that conversation, there's no, no comparison between the Pink Tide governments and those governments that have violently repressed the, the anti-neoliberal protests that began in late 2019 in Chile, in the case of Piñera, in Ecuador, in the case of Moreno, in Colombia, in the case of Duque, in the case of Honduras, in the case of the Hernandez government, which is another right-wing government. And now more recently, in the case of El Salvador, with Bukele's government, the repression has been very pronounced. And that's another factor that explains the polarization between the right and the left, in which the center has somewhat faded out of the picture or has been shunted aside. And the majority of people, the voters, are choosing the pink tide over the right. Yeah, I think those are really, really important points to bring up. I appreciate that you didn't name names, but I know I know of many of the scholars who you're thinking of who are promoting, or d- at least previously, a couple of years ago, were promoting this hyper critique of the pink tide and neo-extractivism, seemingly from a left perspective, at least from their perspective, they're making it for a leftist progressive critique of the pink tide. But really, as you were saying, it's more nuanced than that. And we have to be really careful about how we go about voicing those critiques because it actually it might just reinforce a neoliberal or re- really a far right political agenda. I, I really appreciate that. And like you said, the, the violence of the far right governments of the new the new far right governments down there, it's it's not even comparable to I, of course there might be issues of violence or um, state violence. I mean and. Uh, you know, questionable threats to democracy or authoritarianism in certain progressive contexts, but it's not even comparable to the repression we've seen against the anti-neoliberal movements and protests that have been taking place in certain countries in the past few years. So I I just really appreciate you bringing up that point. Now, we're about out of time, but I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your your insight and knowledge with us. Um, It's always a pleasure when you come on the show. And I, I really want to do this again on your new book. It'd be awesome. Sure. Well, th- again, thanks for the invitation, especially because the topic is uh, not a topic of history, or not only a topic of history, it's a topic of current relevance. And I think that an analysis of these pink tide experiences are extremely important. The book, incidentally, you know, is not a whitewashed job of the pink tide. It's a critical analysis of the pink tide. And I think that's extremely important. There's some people in the United States and perhaps other developed countries that say that, you know, the self-criticisms have to come from people in those countries. And I, I personally don't agree with that. I think that these experiences of the pink tide are so important, not only for those countries, but for countries uh, in the rest of the world as well. And so uh, a critical analysis is certainly in order. So I thank you very much for interviewing me and, and, and doing this podcast. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. It's always a pleasure. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Good. It was my pleasure also, Alex. Well, folks, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. But I want to thank you for listening into our show. Please don't forget to add us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and all of our other social media sites. And please... Share this podcast with your like-minded colleagues, comrades, compañeros y compañeras. We'll be back very soon with our next podcast.